Housing, Neighbourhoods and Leisure Committee. Uh, before I start, I want to read out the webcasting notice. Um, please note this meeting may be filmed for live and or subsequent broadcast via the Council's website. At the start of the meeting, the Chair will confirm if all or part of the meeting is being filmed, which I am doing, you should be aware that the Council is a data controller under the Data Protection Act. Data collected during a webcast will be retained in accordance with the Council's published policy. Members of the public seated in the public gallery will not ordinarily be filmed by the automated camera system. However, please be aware that by moving forward of the pillar or in the unlikely event of a technical malfunction or other unforeseen circumstances, your image may be captured. Therefore, by entering the meeting room, you are consenting to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or for training purposes. Members of the public who participate in the meeting will be able to speak at an on or an off camera microphone, whichever you want to do, according to your preference. Please speak to a member of staff if you have any queries or concerns. Thank you. So, um, item one, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? No, thank you. Item two, the minutes of this meeting, this HNL meeting held on the 10th of November. Does anyone have any point that they wish to bring up about those minutes? Thank you very much. Um, so we can sign those off. We also then have the minutes of the Community Safety Partnership, which are included in the papers. And we'll sign those into the record. Um, item four, petitions. We have no petitions. Item five, questions from members of the public and from councillors. So we do have a question from members, a member of the public. Ms. Jennifer Leach, is she here this evening? Uh, welcome, Ms. Leach. Would you like to step forward to the on or on off camera seat and um, go ahead and please ask your question? Thanks very much for the uh, opportunity to do this. And hi. <laughs> um, so my question I'll read in full. You've all, I think, got a copy of it in front of you. Um, before I submitted my question to you, the committee, I had to first ask myself the question, is it worth my time, my energy, my emotional investment to come back down to the civic officers for more empty rhetoric, having sat through the planning meeting last Wednesday, 2nd of March, when the environmentally destructive Reading Golf Course development was given the green light? My answer to myself was, Allergic as I am to greenwashing, what other option is there before extinction? What will the children say? So I've come today to pose my question. Uh, not the first time I've been to pose a question about, to Festival Republic or about Reading Festival and the carnage that uh, follows it. So the destructive legacy of the festival is a source of great distress to many people in Reading and further afield and the issue has been raised with Festival Republic on countless occasions. The carnage after each festival remains the same. The local grid was at the last time of the last festival still rejected in favour of generators and the environmental impact still remains deeply painful. Affluent festival goers in the UK are likely to be amongst the last wave casualties of environmental breakdown marginalized and poorer indigenous peoples around the world are already its first victims. And to this, I would just like to add the fact that as we're talking about tents, the situation with the um, current refugee situation um, around the Ukraine is of poignant relevance as well. So my question, what do you feel when you look at these photos? Um, thank you, Ms. Leach, for your question. Firstly, I want to say that this meet this committee this evening is not the Planning Applications Committee, and it's not accountable for the decisions made at the Planning Applications Committee. So it's, um, you know, we p invite people here as, and we're really glad you came and we corresponded about it. Um, it's good that we can have members of the public here and scrutinise councillors. That's what we're here for. Councillors who answer questions 
do their best to provide full, honest, comprehensive answers. They don't give empty rhetoric. So let's not start the ball rolling with a kind of criticism of a council who hasn't even had a chance to answer the question first. So I want to just make that clear. This is the HNL committee. It's not planning. Um, that decision was made elsewhere. Anyway, to, in the spirit of openness and wanting to give you the answer that, uh, that you want, uh, I will now invite the relevant lead councillor, who is Councillor Barnett Ward, to answer the question. All right, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms Leach, for your question. Uh, usually, when I think of Reading Festival, what I feel is pride and excitement. The festival is a landmark event, not just for Reading, but for the whole country. And I love the buzz in the air over Festival Weekend, with so many people visiting our town, having an amazing time and making memories they will always treasure. Like many people in Reading, I was shocked at the photographs that came out of Little John's Farm last year. That's not the Reading I know or a version of it that I want presented to the world. These images from Reading Festival and other events around the country are a stark reminder that there is a long way to go to embed the key messages around reduce, reuse, recycle, particularly in a generation that are the most educated, aware and exposed to the impacts of waste on climate change. Festival Republic are attending tonight's meeting and committee members will be questioning them on this and other aspects of last year's festival. I'm sure Festival Republic will be able to speak to the measures that they take and continue to build on to reduce waste. Councillors have also asked officers to continue to engage and challenge the festival to find new ways of reducing its environmental impact. I'm aware that the event organisers do take steps to manage the impact on Reading, including the use of biofuels for their generators, recycling points in the arena and across the campsites, partnerships with organisations such as Greenpeace and sustainable travel options, but I urge them to do more. However, I will remind everyone here present that we cannot hand off all responsibility to the festival organisers. Our disposable culture means that festival goers can buy a tent for less than tenth of the price of their weekend ticket. There is a need for retailers to take a more responsible approach to the sale of festival accessories such as tents. These are sold as essentially disposable items and are of a quality which precludes them from effective reuse and they offer limited opportunity for recycling, even for extraction of energy. Without a wider environmentally focused approach to events, it is likely that such images as the one included here will be a continuing feature. I know from speaking to festival goers, particularly young festival goers, that they believe or perhaps convince themselves that anything they leave behind is automatically donated to charities. They don't realise that while some charities do run salvage operations after festivals, it is logistically impossible to sort through the vast amounts of items being left behind so only a fraction will ever be reused. We all have a responsibility to talk to our children, friends, co-workers, anyone we know who will be camping at a festival this summer, and make sure they understand the environmental damage they do when treating tents and camping equipment as single use items and abandoning them on site. We need to make sure they understand that if they want to donate their tent, they need to pack it up and hand it in at a charity collection point, not simply walk away and leave it in a field. Every parent of a young person heading to Reading this summer needs to insist that everything they leave home with comes back. There is a well-known rule of thumb for visiting beaches. Leave nothing behind but your footprints, take nothing away but your memories. I hope the Reading 22 festival goers take away all sorts of amazing things from their time in our town this summer. But the only things we want to see on the fields of Little John's Farm at the end of August bank holiday weekend are the footprints left behind by thousands of dancing feet. Thank you, Councillor Bonnetwood. Ms Leach, would you like to ask a, a supplemental question? It's difficult to, not, uh, to know what to say. I was present at the um, XR Festival team two years ago that worked with Festival Republic to try and uh, prevent the, the photos that, that I'm looking at in front of me. And um, I think a monster has been unleashed that it's very difficult to, to pack away, probably like the tents. Um, I hear lots of lots of words and I think a moment will come probably when enough people look at those photographs with such a sense of complete distress, personal distress, that um, they just say no more and they find a way of making sure it's no more. Would, you, would you like to ask a question, Ms Leach, because it's really a I just don't know what to, to say. I have no questions. 
Okay, well, that's fine. Um, thank you very much indeed then for that, for that contribution. Um, now we'll move on to item seven, uh, item six, um, decision book references. So we don't have any decision book references. Um, item seven is the, um, very pertinently, is the evaluation of Reading Festival 2021. Um, we have representatives of Festival Republic here this evening and we're very welcome to them. Uh, as, um, do you want to do an introduction, James, before we speak? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, good evening and welcome to uh, Noel Painting and Vicky Chapman from uh, Festival Republic. Uh, we, we've had a discussion about the presentation this evening um, and members were offered the opportunity to put some questions in advance to Festival Republic, which hopefully they've picked up within their presentation this evening. Key, uh, three key areas that are the focus of the evaluation this year, uh, are certainly around uh, sustainability, um, uh, safeguarding, because that's been a, a, a particular challenge over a number of years, and particularly with the age group uh, that Reading Festival attracts, and there's some really key and important work that's been done here. Um, and then the third area is around um, how we uh, engage on, um, uh, it's, just, it's, coming, it's coming to me, it's coming to me. And in fact, you know what, I'll pass over to Noel uh, and uh, Vicky to, to help me with this. It's a really interesting and engaging presentation. Uh, there, obviously, there's an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, but I, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of content here uh, for uh, members to consider. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. So uh, what, perhaps what we'll do, if, you, if you're happy with this, then Noel and Vicky, is that we do your presentation and then at the end of it, open up the floor, for, take a few questions. Uh, I think the presentation is about 20 minutes, we said something like that. So it's uh, fairly long and comprehensive, but there's a lot to cover and uh, we're really, really interested in the content. So uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, I was last here in March 2020 um, and I recognise some faces. Unfortunately, I can't remember all the names, um, but I'd really like to thank everybody for the opportunity in coming in, in coming along to talk to you again. Um, clearly nothing happened in the summer of 2020, but we were really pleased that the event in 2021 went ahead. Um, and we'd like to look back on 2021 and, and go forwards into 2022 and look at what we can do do better because we try and improve every year. Um, I'd also like to thank Jennifer for coming along. Um, I, I realise, you know, people feel very strongly um, about the impact that we have and indeed festivals and actually any event, even going on holiday has, has an impact. Um, but I would like to look at the way we mitigate any impact we can have and, and how we can increasingly mitigate that impact as we go forward into 2022 and 23 and, and beyond. Um, so I think probably the best thing is to, is to show you the slides, but thanks for the, in, for the invite. And I think what I, I think I said this last time, unfortunately you didn't do it in 2020 because there wasn't an event, but um, if any members want to come along uh, to talk to us actually at any point, um, but particularly when we're on site in August, um, whether it's during the build, uh, whether it's during the event to look around, we can't always promise you can get onto the stage, but you know, it just just make contact, make contact primarily, I mean directly, but but if not through James, and we're more than happy to talk to you and explain what we do and and, and how we try and make things better each year on, a, on an ongoing basis. That's probably five minutes in already, isn't it? So sorry. Um, right. Uh, okay, so um, Reading 2022. Um, so just a few key points here. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. Sorry. I'm I'm, I'm using. Is it left and right? It's left sorry. It's not my. That's not, the current. Right. Okay. Uh, sorry. It's not my. Um, it's not my. So, um, Reading 2021. Um, successful year for Festival Republic. Um, it was great to be back. We didn't have quite as many shows in as in in 2021. We were involved with the government in their pilot schemes, um, uh, and that started with the show in Sefton Park in Liverpool in uh, eight, May, first beginning of May 2021. Um, and then we ran some more pilot events, one at Download, one at Latitude. And, and as they went forwards and COVID, COVID wasn't having such an impact on the population as we expected, or we were hoping it wouldn't have an impact, um, we were able to go ahead with uh, Reading 2021. So this was the first year back after the pandemic. And I think there are some impacts that that had um in the way that certain things happen and certainly in terms of the litter and the tents and things i, I do think that was part of it 
high profile artists sold out in record time. Clearly, there's a great appetite for festivals. Um, we got really good press coverage, notwithstanding the fact that there were a few photographs of tents left in fields um, with some uh, parts of the press. Um, we had fairly strong COVID policies in place um, so that people were required to show evidence of negative testing. And actually during the build, the crew, well, I was testing every day, basically. Um, and, and during the build, we were particularly vigilant at making sure we didn't lose members of crew uh, to COVID. Um, we had a successful partnership working around safeguarding, of which I'll talk a little bit more later, um, and a safe, generally safe and secure festival. Clearly, we're licensed for 105,000 people. It's not the same experience for everybody, but you know, we make it as safe and secure as, uh, as we can, bearing in mind the numbers we have. Um, just going forward to 2022, um, we're advertising early birds uh, for again, so we'll have probably 20,000 people uh, on site on Wednesday the 24th. Um, general camping opens on the Thursday, and then we've got day ticket holders. Um, I haven't got the exact breakdown of numbers, but we have day ticket holders that come through under the license on the Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And then the campsite closes, uh, or if we can get everybody off site, which we generally do, uh, the campsite closes at 12 o'clock on the Monday. Um, this is the lineup. So uh, if anybody, I mean, I think there's something for everybody here, um, and including me actually, uh, in terms of all the headliners. Um, so really good lineup. Um, we have a few tickets left, but I think they're, you know, sort of we're squeezing people in the corners in terms of day tickets. I think uh, actually I haven't got it here, but I think we sold out for weekend tickets. Um, in terms of challenges going forwards, um, most of you will know, and we planning came up earlier, um, there is quite a lot of building work going ahead at the moment and increasingly going ahead around the area of the festival at its eastern extremity. So we've lost Rivermead car park to building works. Uh, we're losing the golf driving range to the school development, assuming that, start, that hasn't started on site yet, but it should be starting on site. Um, clearly what's happening in Ukraine and, and other areas, you know, we've still got a, a CT threat, a counter-terrorism threat. Um, we are losing the golf driving range. Uh, we are looking at changes to because we've lost where we have the coach drop off. That's changing. Um, we are opening up Orange Gate, which those of you who know Wigmore Lane, we will be using that for coach customers only um, to mitigate some of the impact of losing the other car parks. Um, I will talk about back of house and front of house testing a little bit. Um, and I know there's some uh, keenness from, from some members uh, to look at front house testing and, and, and I'll talk about that or I'm happy to talk about that and ask questions. Um, we have some safeguarding challenges. Um, one of the things about 2021 was, yeah, a different type of audience. Some of them weren't quite sure what to do because we had lots and lots of people who hadn't been to a festival before. And I think that possibly uh, impacted their environmental behaviours, um, but more of that later. Uh, so Kira is the focus today, economic impact, and I'll be quite quick on that. Um, Vicky Chapman, um, who I should have introduced right at the beginning, is our sustainability champion, not just for Reading Festival, but actually for Festival Republic and other Live Nation shows across the UK and Ireland. Um, and we'll talk in some detail about what we're doing to mitigate our environmental impact. Um, and lastly, uh, we'll look at safeguarding. But first of all, just a few words on economic impact. We've done economic impact studies um, a few years, 2009, 2010, 14 and 15. Um, and we looked at, uh, you know, the sort of overall impact of the festival. Um, this hasn't, this isn't actually in the public domain. So this is um, us making a public announcement for the first time. And we will give you a press release. Um, but we uh, use a company called Fourth Street to carry out an economic impact uh, of the festival uh, in 2021. Um, they interviewed festival goers, they talked to crew, they talked to our contractors, they talked to businesses around Reading, and they identified in connection with the festival a £64 million pounds of expenditure um, leading up to and over the festival period. Um, and that £48 million of that was declared as incremental to the UK economy. Um, and of which 8.5 million expenditure was directly into the Reading economy. Um, that's on obviously just on, on one year. Um, we had, uh, and this is a rounded number, but roughly something just under 5,000 people working at the festival, of whom 500 live in Reading. Um, and that uh, just number crunched uh, is the equivalent of 120 full-time jobs. Um, we did survey uh, businesses and certainly, you know, some businesses, let's not pretend everything is perfect, 
lose business because of the festival. But overall, most of the people we um, surveyed were very positive because of the uh, economic uh, benefit of having the festival. I will now pass you to Vicky. Thank you, Noel, and thank you everybody for inviting us here today. Really, really pleased to be able to share this with you. And thank you, Miss Leach, for your question. I hope to address it as part of this presentation. So I'm, yeah, I'm Head of Sustainability for Live Nation UK and Ireland. I work with Festival Republic really closely. Um, my previous role was dedicated at Festival Republic as their sustainability coordinator, and I've been with the organisation, the broader organisation, for, for six years now. And we have a dedicated sustainability team on site uh, at the festival and also in the office. It's something we do take very seriously. And it's something that Melvin Benn has been championing for a very long time in 2007 was when we first had a, a sustainability consultant looking at, at the festival or public festivals. This um, is our overarching um, policy. Uh, we have in 2019 um, Live Nation presented and put forward Green Nation, which is our sustainability charter for a global com uh, company across across the world. So that a kind of headline is as a world leader in live entertainment, we have a responsibility to preserve the live music experience for generations to come. Um, if there's there's a campaign uh, group called uh, Music Declares Emergency, which I'll come on to later, and their strap line is no music on a dead planet. So we feel really passionately about this. We're here to put on live music events, but we want that to continue. That's what we love. So um, kind of the question earlier, kind of coming back to that, we we want to make sure we have a, a minimal environmental impact as we're creating these shows. So we have eight uh, broad areas um, of our sustainability charter, uh, but then that's divided into three pillars. So engagement is the first pillar and that covers our fans, artists, the staff that come to the festivals, um, our local uh, connection to the local community as well and our um, vendors and um, sponsors that we work together with. Um, how we engage with the, all of those stakeholders and communicate sustainability aims clearly and transparently and use our position to raise awareness of environmental issues as well. On the left hand corner there we have climate change and we have uh, overarching target to reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 and that's our scope one and two emissions. Um, we're going through a process globally to look at our scope three emissions and setting a, a net zero target. But because we're a global organisation that does have to come from um, all, all of the different markets as well. It also covers uh, how we power our offices, venues and festivals and we aim to power our, uh, all of our events and festivals by 100% renewable energy by 2030. And transportation comes under this as well. So um, pledging to have good transport links to the festivals and work with local suppliers and authorities to encourage the use of sustainable transport. And then the last pillar on the right hand side there is resource efficiency. So that covers all of the uh, resources that we're using as, as an event. So the waste that we generate, the plastics, looking at zero single use plastic, um, the water and the food that we um, consume at the festivals as well. So I'll just go through each of those pillars in turn and give, and give you some examples of the work that we're doing at, at Reading Festival. So um, I've already gone through our target, but our energy supplier contract includes um, planning the on-site energy efficiency by monitoring individual generators and we monitor them annually and we review where um, the sizing of generators could be reduced based on what they actually used that previous year. Um, as mentioned in the, um, in the introduction, we use a biofuel um, where uh, which emits 90% less CO2 emissions than regular diesel and we also make sure our suppliers are using energy efficient equipment such as LED festoon and tower lights um, and um, other um, measures that they can take. Improvements in technology are, are coming on all the time so we're making sure we're kept up to date with the innovation that's out there. So our strategy towards energy is first of all reducing the amount of energy that we're using. So looking at battery storage solutions where possible to reduce the need for generators. And we do have a main supply on site. I think that was noted um, in the question. We actually use, we max that out every year. Um, we use 100% of this feed that was uh, that comes into Reading Festival to power the production and part of the artist areas. 
So we're actually looking into um, where we're putting some serious resource into looking into having a, extending that main supply and see if we can get more of a main supply to to the festival sites, because that is one key way that we could reduce our carbon emissions. That's a longer term plan. So then once we've reduced as much as possible, we replace um, what we can't reduce with with other forms. So biofuel is a way to to look at to replace. Um, we have increased the amount of biofuel from 2015 to 2019 from 14 to 26 percent. And this year we're looking, we like my team, we look at what our carbon emission reductions need to be and then we look at what ways we can meet those reductions. So we're working with our power supplies in the first instance, but then we can purchase the amount of biofuel that we need to to reduce those emissions as much as possible. And then one other initiative that we did in 2019 was actually start to look into the carbon footprint of food. Um, we displayed carbon food print um, information on the menus in um, one area in the street feast area, and we plan to extend that uh, this year as well. So it's really to look into how that works, how it's perceived by customers, and it's to give them information about um, what the carbon is in their meal so they can make a make a, a choice themselves. So the work that we do starts a long way before the festival. So um, we communicate in advance the options that ex exist for low carbon travel. So we work with Big Green Coach and we set out there the difference um, between travelling by coach, train, camper van and then car sharing um, or not. So they can see the different carbon emissions that are involved. We work with Go Car Share um, to publicise Go Car Sharing to the festivals. And um, we also incentivise this by having a priority car park that festival goers who do register and sign up with the Go Car Share scheme can park in for free. We speak to our customers about tents in advance as well. In 2019 and 2021, we put together this tent buying guide and we wanted to speak to them before and educate them about buying a suitable tent that they want to reuse. Um, it's giving them information on what to look for, such as the waterproof rating. And it's just it's written in the way that um, kind of will resonate with the Reading audience. And right at the end there, we do have a kind of a, a statement that says take take it home with you that's throughout all of our communications and our messaging we always come back to that take it home message um, and we are clear on our website that exactly what you said in the start it you can't just leave it in the field if you want to donate it you have to pack it out and actually physically hand it to someone we're really working hard to try and um, come move away from that misconception that if you leave your tent behind it's going to get picked up by the charities. So we're really working hard on that, inf that information, how that goes out to people. So another example of pre-communications is single use plastics. So on the, the yellow box there is our um, ultimate festival checklist. And at the, the last one is the reusable bottle. So we encourage people to bring reusable bottles to minimize the amount of plastic that's on site. We have water refill stations that's publicised. We have a map that shows where they are so people can refill their bottles and people can also buy uh, reusable bottles on site if they don't have their own one. We sell no virgin single use plastic. All of our bottled water contains a minimum of 50 percent recycled content. And that's a target that we set within the Green Nation Charter for the end of 2021. But we we have already achieved that at Reading Festival. Um, we know we provide no pre-bottled water as standard to artists and crew. They all need to bring their reusable bottles. Um, and we also have soft drink post mix outlets available. Um, so that reduces the need for a soft drink to be served in a plastic bottle. So they can just go like you do at the cinema. It's filled up with a paper cup. And compostable uh, plastic cutlery and straws have been banned since 2009 and only compostable materials are permitted. And the sustainability team will go around and check on that. And we have a process in place, a uh, yellow red card policy. If traders are, founding, are found to be using plastics, we can shut down their stalls or fine them. We take it really seriously. So I'll just run through some of the initiatives that we have, uh, the public facing uh, initiatives to encourage recycling and to minimise waste. So we've had a deposit return scheme in place since 2013 um, where uh, customers can collect their cups, return their cups for cash. And in we collect around six tonnes of cups. It's a really popular scheme and we publicise it on the main stage, notifications um, on the app 
at the website beforehand, any and newsletters that go out on kind of World Environment Day or Earth Day, we tend to do a big push on our environmental um, incentives there. And we also that we have been working with the co-op for the last two years who introduced a reverse vending machine in their store on site, which has been um, which is the first time that they actually introduced that in their stores. And it was a, a festival first as well. We have a recycling uh, championship scheme in the campsite, so um, uh, campers can win prizes for the amount of waste or recycling that they bring back to to the recycling points. Each campsite has a recycling point and we have a green team that gives out recycling bags that tells people what can go in those bags and they can win prizes and we're trying to make it um, as immediate prizes as, as possible. So we work with our sponsors on experiences that they could get access to a viewing a viewing platform, for example. We have merchandise that's available um, or tickets for next year. So we've got three different tiers of prizes depending on what they bring back, but it's ultimately encouraging people to, to, to reward that positive behaviour that we want to uh, engage them on. The tent campaign is re really core to this in 2019. The, um, the banner outside the Reading Festival had our take it home messaging as well. So it was the first thing that you saw as you walked through uh, into Reading straight away. And then that was repeated on the main stages and um, Miss Leach joined us with Extinction Rebellion and, and helped us really push that message across the site. And I think that's a really good example of um, working together with local communities and local activists as well because this is a, a, an issue that is important to a lot of people's hearts and if we can bring as many people oops, sorry sorry i think it's listening to me i'm trying to just put it into, this is like trying to be on the timer so um so yeah just sorry the importance of connecting with local community and local um, campaigns as well and then moving that out towards some of the uh, broader campaigns that we've been working on and we continue to work on uh, over the last two shows so 2019 and 2021 we've had a campaign a zero waste festival goer campaign where we asked festival goers and artists to make pledges um, for the environment and this was intended to encourage um, kind of peer-to-peer -peer influence and social norming so make it look like it's not the festival telling people what to do, which automatically switches people off. It's the peer, it's the festival goers standing up and saying, I'm pledged to take my tent home, I won't litter. And it's the, the youth activists who are in that <laughs> bottom left corner as well. It's that peer messaging to really try and change that behavior and say, it's, look, it's someone like me who actually cares. I don't have to be part of the gang who don't care. So it's trying to just bring in the, that, um, youth uh, element there. And just wanted to point out that in 2021 we updated that messaging with the uh, UK government's um, campaign in the run-up towards COP26 called Together for Our Planet and that was asking individuals and businesses what they were doing to go one step greener. So we thought that was a really good uh, way to connect the two together. And an image of Reading Festival was actually displayed at COP26 as an example of UK culture going one step greener. They used our target of 100% renewable energy by 2030. So the delegates could see um, Reading Festival at, um, at COP26. So I was really proud of that. So the work that we uh, do with artists is also really important because that peer to peer influence um, is effective, but also that the artist influence is very effective. They have a huge influence over their fans. So Enter Shakiri had the climate stripes and that was from Reading University as well. And we've worked with the 1975 who did a collaboration with Greta Thunberg and that they presented her, that they put her song on the big screens um, and the lyrics. And it was such an amazing experience. It was everyone was listening really intently. And then when the song started up again, there was just this murmur of conversation. And it's just that's we were really engaging with um, the festival goers on on climate change and the importance of this issue. So we do run a salvage operation that was mentioned earlier. Um, we invite, well, in 2021, 79 groups applied to salvage at Reading and that consisted of 180 volunteers. But that's usually, we normally have around 250 volunteers on site for, for salvaging. And this year, well, 21, we worked with 
Southwest Food Collective, and they um, salvaged 2.4 tonnes of food uh, at the festival, and most of that was from the campsites. So we can see that there are, like the, the engagement with the festival goes, they do want to do the right thing and give their food to a charity. It's just making that as visible as possible. And it's really pushing that message that yes, you do have to hand it into a person or a collection point, don't leave it in the fields. So do we, are assessed externally. Um, we work with Julie's Bicycle and we've been participating since 2009 in the Creative Green Assessment and they review um, every year our uh, commitment to reduce that impact and um, we're assessed on our commitment, understanding and improvement towards environmental sustainability. And in 2019, we were really pleased to be awarded five out of five stars and the 21 results are awaited. So this, this report is on available on the website and we'll update it when the 21 report has been, has been published. So this shows an example of, of the, um, the report. So we measure our carbon footprint and it gives us a carbon footprint report. And, and I just wanted to pull out a few stats there. So thanks to the local involvement of the local Extinction Rebellion group, um, in 2019, we saw a 52% reduction in tents left behind. We, that did go up in 2021, and we know that it is an issue, but we think that that did have something to do with, um, like as Noel mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, the COVID and potentially people not wanting to share tents, there were more tents and, and creeping back into that single use culture we got to a really, I think we got to a really good point in 2019. We had these messages across all the different touch points and we just need to get back to that point again. So our communications plan this year is, is, is seeing what worked in 2019 and how we can replicate that again and build on that. And just touching on recycling rates. So we, uh, our current recycling rate is 69, well in 2021, it was 69.9% and we always strive to achieve the the same or if not better than the local authority um, and Reading Borough Council's recycling rate is 36%. So we're really pleased that we're able to continually improve on our recycling rates. And we have been zero waste to landfill since 2019. I know that's not the fact that the rest of the waste will be going to incineration or recycling, but at least we can say for two years, we no waste is going to landfill. We're just working hard to reduce what goes to incineration and increase what goes to recycling through the initiatives I've already mentioned. And just to finish, I just wanted to talk through some of the work we're doing in the broader industry. We're on the steering group of a group called Vision 2025, which is a network of 500 outdoor events taking climate action, and they've developed tools and, and resources we have signed Music Declares Emergency, uh, which is a campaign I mentioned earlier, which is no music on a dead planet and can really bring in some of that artist um, involvement. And we also sponsor a podcast uh, called Sounds Like a Plant, which is looking at um, the work that's happening in the music industry. So it's amplifying the work that others are doing, bringing together and learning from what's going on outside of, of, our, own, of our own bubble. So yeah, thank you. That's um, me finished. I'll hand back over to Noel and happy to answer any questions at the end. I'm, I'm very conscious that we're slightly abusing the 20 minutes you allowed us, um, but I think that's really useful information. We have got 12 slides left, but if you'll permit me, I'll go through them as pretty quickly. Is that okay? Jeff? If you could. Yeah, because we'll have Q and A as well. So yeah, yeah no, no, I'll, I'll go through these really quickly. Um, something we introduced back in, I think, originally sort of 2018, and sort of de developed each year is safeguarding. Um, so uh, you know, all sorts of reasons why things change from from uh, 2019 to 21. I think sort of increasing use of social media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we set up uh, a safeguarding system back in 2018, as I say, developed through further into 21. We have a safeguarding coordinator. And whilst we had different teams in place before that, we didn't really bring them together. So um, we have a welfare team, TLC Welfare in 2021. Uh, we got the medics, we got welfare crew, safe hubs. Um, we you brought brick on, a brook on site. We got music support, Samaritan, Salvation Army, street pastors and info tents. And all of those work together to provide a safer event. Um, we also work with Thames Valley Police, GAS, uh, South Central and Zambulus Service and Bright Futures and RBC. Um, so down, so, is it moving? Okay, thank you. 
Um, something that came up was back of house testing. Um, one, sorry, we're not. It's stuck on the on there, but it's moving on hours. Oh, hang on. Oh, there we, there go. we go. Here we go. Here we go. We've been timed out. <laughs> sorry. I think we'll. I need to rejoin. Yeah, I don't know why that went. The it's the internet, yeah. I, I can, I mean, I, I can sort of make up the rest of it. I, I can't, I've got slides. Uh, can we, if we get, get the slides, slides out, I'll just quickly talk through what we've got on the slides, but I'll do it really quickly. Um, one interesting thing was um, back of house testing um, that, uh, hang on, how do I just get that up? Okay, back of house testing. Um, yeah, we saw a, a drop in back of house testing last year. And, and one of the things we moved to in 2021, which everybody's done, is go cashless. Um, and I think as a result of that, there may have been less activity in the drug market, can I say, um, in, in 2021. Um, uh, and as a result of that, we did have less uh, back of house testing. Um, we also have been working, uh, we worked in 2021 with a, a fact working group, which consisted of RBC, public health, drug alcohol teams, Leeds City Council, TVP uh, and, and Festival Republic. And um, we had, uh, hang on. You carry on, I can't see the slide. <laughs> Sorry, um, so we had messaging focus group uh, with seven schools uh, based in Berkshire um, and that's re-established now and, and meets every two months. Um, we had some uh, basically signs telling people about tolerance levels, knowing their limits, not mixing. Hang on. Oh, right, okay. I've lost control, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, trying not to make up for lost time um, and uh, making sure they don't hide. Basically safeguarding messages that we put out, not mixing drugs, not mixing alcohol and drugs, just acting in a safe way. Um, we had uh, a help map which showed where the safe hubs were around the campsite. Um, unfortunately, we had uh, the Red Cross dropped out at the last minute, so we were only able to offer the safe hubs during the night time, which is actually when they're busiest. Um, but going forwards into 2022, we will keep those safe hubs running 24-7 through the campsite. And they're basically drop-ins where people can go to find a safe place. And, you know, and, and the key thing is, um, going back to a slide you can't see, can but can our, our, can you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, in. we'll just go back to that yeah. one then. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Now, sorry, I just, I, we've got like three slides, so just, um, to just to show you can see some of the pictures. Gonna go? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, there's a site map basically, which which we displayed around the site. And if I could just pick up, we're back on. Oh, we're back on. Okay, I'll oh, crack here, right, okay. Right, we'll just whiz through this, not too fast to miss what I did. Okay, keep going. Stop. Okay, we're locked. Um, I think I'll stop there because no, is it moving? Is it moving? Is it moving? OK, so so these were the some of the signs we've got. Don't be a state hydrate. Uh, leave the mixing to the DJ sort of, you know, audience friendly messages. Basically, we put up. Um, and, you know, basically, you know, if there's something wrong with you, don't feel you can't talk to people, don't feel you can't go to security because you've, you know, done something silly, let's say. Um, so our staff are here to help, not judge. Um, that was the map. Um, this was around the campsite. Uh, we also have an app for the festival. This is available on the app. Basically places people can go, you know, for whatever reason, if they're feeling unsafe or they can take somebody else to. Other achievements in 2021, well, we talked about the focus groups. We brought Brooke on site for the first time, Safe Gigs for Women. Um, we encouraged bystander intervention and that was through the website and through the app. Um, we added in a medical point in the arena. Um, we introduced something called purple response teams. And this was somebody from medical, somebody from security and somebody from welfare that went out as a triple into the campsites to deal with incidents. Um, and we're continuing to review uh, plans and services. Um, 
sorry about the sort of last few slides not coming up. Um, but I think we're looking to move forwards with that. I think the safeguarding campaigns and the safeguarding system has worked really well. Um, and the key thing about it is being gluing everybody together that we're sort of operating, I wouldn't say in silos, but, but perhaps somewhat isolated in the past. Um, thank you very much. Sorry if we've overused our allowance of time. That's all right. Thank you very much for that. And um, to be honest, the last few slides were really, really important and I wanted to see them. So it's a good job we got there. I didn't want to truncate it in any way. Uh, so thanks, Noel and Vicky. Right now we're going to have a short ish time for, for questions. So they better be good. Um, I think like, hold on. And then uh, <laughs> maybe and then I think Graham asked first and then uh, Karen and then gosh, we'll start with those. Do we, should we go through like three, the old three at a time thing people sometimes do where you go three questions, three answers. Yeah, you try that. All right, well, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to be collaborative. It's like, okay, um, we'll start with Adele. See how long the questions. I, I predict it will be quite long. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, yeah. Councillor Barnett. Uh, yes, I didn't even recognise him just the first time. <coughs> um, well, first of all, just to comment on the Reading recycling rate. Since we brought in a food waste recycling scheme last February, it's been above fifty percent. Okay, so uh, do check that. Um, my query is about waste um, in waste management, as well as the photographs that we've seen tonight. Um, council officers tell me they cleared 28 tonnes of waste from council owned land associated with the festival. And it's great to see the things that you're doing, um, but it does seem to be carrot to me. And I'm wondering if it's time to apply the stick. Um, maybe it's time to take a deposit. If you had your deposit return scheme for cups, maybe you need to do that with tents. What more can you do? Because it feels like I, I get that you're saying that last year was an anomaly and there were newer people and that the year before was better, but it still wasn't great. So I'm wondering what more you can do to actually compel people to take their tents away, to take their camping chairs home and do the right thing rather than asking nicely. All right, I think, yeah, come straight back on that if you could. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it, it's a it's a good question and it's a it's a valid question. Um, we are putting on a festival that we want customers to come and, and enjoy themselves and have a good time. And but we're trying to make sure that we're looking at every single touch point to to get people to think about the impact that they're having. We have looked into um, t deposits on tents, but the logistics of that um, is, is is huge to actually make sure and, and making sure that they are. Um, taking their tent home, like how do we prove that it's their tent when they're sharing their tents? Um, it's um, and in terms of kind of the messaging around uh, environmental impacts as well, we find behaviour change um, impacts the positive messages go down better than the negative messages. So actually having that kind of heavy hands um, that hasn't worked in other um, places, but we do know that we need to be more direct and that's something that we're look, looking at this year being more direct with people because that's what did work in 2019 it was straight away take your tent home and rather than kind of we'd like you to do this or please do that we're definitely taking more of a direct stance this year um, but actually forcing people and putting kind of deposits and fines on on it we've not gone down down that route yet but it's something that i can take back and, and come back to you on okay th thanks thanks a lot vicky Councillor O'Connell. Thank you. Um, mine's actually on the safeguarding and um, it's really good to see the partner agencies sort of being more embedded uh, with Festival Republic. I can see how that can make for a more efficient um, and uh, positive experience for the young people. Um, my my query though is, is not the partner agencies, it's actually um, the security uh, that you employ because there were several negative stories in the press last year uh, regarding um, the, the securities treatment of young people, um, including uh, security guards taking um, some 16 year old uh, boys 
uh, who had jumped the fence, um, but instead of taking them to a sort of place of safety and going through the processes, uh, they were taken into the Oxfordshire countryside. Um, and this was at around about midnight and left by the security guards, I presume to teach them some kind of a lesson. Um, that doesn't feel very safe to me. Um, my understanding also is that those security guards um, were identified and remained working for the rest of uh, the festival. Um, so yeah, my, my concerns are around the security guards um, rather than the other. Thank you for that. Yeah, certainly. Um, we did have challenges uh, with various uh, teams um, during the 2021 festival as a result of COVID. Um, one issue was with cleaners, um, and that isn't the reason the tents were left behind, but um, we struggled to get cleaners and, and COVID and um, and, and Brexit, um, that being too controversial, and I think it's even controversial, means that we were struggling for staff. We also struggled for security staff, um, and uh, we had several teams that came in quite late, and whilst we vet teams, there were people who we certainly won't be uh, employing again, but moreover, um, just back to the remained working, I think once I, I'd need to, to fact check, but I'm pretty certain once we found out that what had happened and who was responsible and we got more details, they ceased to work. Um, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm happy to fact check that. Um, certainly going forwards, you know, we want to employ people that we can trust because, because people go to security as part of their safeguarding. And there were two or three incidents which are regrettable. Um, and, you know, we we will have more accountability from our security staff this year. And I think because we've got more of a lead up, we had quite a short lead up towards the festival. This isn't an excuse for what happened, um, but we recruited more people last minute and sub the, the security companies subcontracted in more people in different companies than they would normally, which led to um, perhaps less vigorous checking. And I'm not saying it may have been that those people were checked. I'm happy to come back and give you some details on that specific incident with the 16 year olds and it certainly did go into the press. Thanks, but, we can be reassured that that's not your policy. That the you can be absolutely, yeah. I was horrified when I found out yeah. and, and I actually dealt with it. So I, I just need to, it's a few months ago and I need to check exactly what happened and when, but I'm quite happy to give a, a report on that particular incident. Yeah, if you could, I think you would like that, wouldn't you, Mary? Just to... No, it, it, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I fully accept that. I fully accept yeah, that. I, I think, I think they have, they're not defending that happening. I mean, it's, you know, obviously wrong. Um, Councillor Hoskin. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And, and um, Mary just asked uh, the question about security that I was going to. And so I suppose I would just say that'd be something I think personally and I expect a lot of colleagues will be looking out for that you've, you know, that the lessons have been learned from uh, last year and the uh, security operation is is more effective and uh, and, and and safe. So that's, that's the thing. Um, I've got, there's, there's two areas. One I'm not really going to do on because I think the welfare um, I was going to ask about, but you've, you've cover that quite well I think in a presentation I'm really pleased around the safe hubs being uh, 24 hours you know and, um, and the work there so uh, that's good uh, but really important um, so my third question which is the real one to ask is is about the front of house testing which you sort of skirted over in your presentation somewhat I mean I think I think you're perhaps right in terms of um, you know the cashless uh, system have an effect but I don't think there's any um, I think we can be sure that that will continue to have an effect in terms of drugs use on, on, on sites. I think the history of young people uh, and drugs shows that kids will take drugs at festivals. And what we need to be about is um, providing the kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, you know, messaging and support that, that has been put in place. But also there's a lot of evidence that front of house testing, which is whereby, you know, kids can, can bring their drugs to be tested, see what's in there. Um, can have a, a significant and major impact on reducing risks and deaths at festivals. And we've seen that across 
uh, countries where that's been employed with death uh, uh, festivals has has dramatically fallen in a number of countries where front of house testing happens. And partly because uh, one of the things that's so important around it is you, that we can have that communication with kids that have drugs and are thinking of using them. A number will uh, leave them behind when they find out what's in there. Um, but also a number will also listen to the uh, advice around, um, you know, the risks of, of drug use and, and the welfare. Uh, you know, facilities that are in place. And I think that's really uh, important as well. So I would urge uh, yourselves to, to further consider that. I don't know where the government and the Home Office is with the thinking around front of house testing. At least it's very hard to know where the government is on a lot of issues. And this one, I'm not quite sure where they are. But um, personally, I think this is something I'd really like to see explored. I think it can have a really important uh, role to play uh, in safeguarding, um, you know, the kids that go to festivals. Uh, and, you know, we any death that could occur in the future from from uh, drug use at uh, Reading Festival, we, I really want to know that we've explored all the options for trying to reduce that risk. Thanks. I think there was a question in there. Would you like to, I think, comment on front of house testing? Is the, mm, is the thing, I'm absolutely happy to. Um, we do back of house testing. That's the first thing which, which members may be aware of. Um, and when we find things, we use the app and we use the screens on the main stage, which are two massive ones either side and behind the front of house to convey messages about what's been found and what is dangerous. So we test back of house. Um, we're happy to look with Reading Borough Council at front of house testing. Um, and, and we will, if there's a strong uh, feeling from uh, RBC that you would like front of house testing, uh, we'll certainly look at it. And, and, you know, if you'd like us to, we will introduce it. I think the caveat or what I'd like to say on behalf of Festival Republic is there's a risk that that gives a full sense of safety. Um, and, and these are all things you'll know. But, but one thing is that whatever you test only tells you how long that particular or how strong that particular drug and what's in that particular drug. As you'll know, most things are sort of homemade in batches. So you may have two tablets from different batches that look exactly the same with different strengths. Um, that uh, also um, how they react with different individuals. So, you know, we might test something and it's deemed relatively safe, but for a particular individual, it may not be. Um, the deaths from drugs, I think at recent festivals, has all been from polyuse, uh, mixing drugs with alcohol or mixing drugs rather than from individual drugs. So it might be that the drug is tested and is safe, but nevertheless, um, you know, people mix and that can have then a completely different effect. Um, so we're very happy to look at it with Ready Borough Council. And, you know, but I think we've just got a caveat that it, it may be, it may provide a full sense of security for people who may be inclined to take drugs. That, that's 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 it really. So so I think the point being that by testing it, you're not saying this is safe. And that, that would be, have to be a very clear message. But yeah, I'll let you come back just if it's very, very briefly. Quickly very, very briefly. Subject. Yeah, really welcome, hopefully, those conversations around that. Of course, exactly the things that you're saying are the kind of conversations you can have with the people that come there to test, you know, to be drugs. So actually, you can make it very, very clear all of those risks to people that have actually presented those drugs. So. I think, you know, it sounds like it's a good conversation that we can have on, on this. Councillor Hoskin, Councillor Rowland, and then I've got Josh after. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair. And um, I want to uh, firstly uh, thank, thank you all um, for the benefits, obviously, uh, that Reading Festival brings to, to the community. You all covered the economic benefits and everything, and I know that while we are all um, busy cross-examining you, which which uh, is part of part of our obligation and part of your part of your commitment to us working with us uh, to answer these uh, tough questions, it is really important that we acknowledge the the uh, benefits that we have uh, together uh, and the benefits that over the years Reading Festival has brought to to this town. So. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, I wanted to um, go and ask you a question uh, that, that will be a bit off, of obviously, of that subject, but in terms of the river safety, and you may not have an answer for me tonight, and I, I thoroughly understand that, but uh, in terms of the the economy uh, and the positive economy that the festival brings to town, it also means uh, an economic boon, uh, possibly for some less scrupulous and more scrupulous uh, persons that transport uh, 
transport along the river and transport uh, um, in, in a form of taxi rides and things like that. There have been instances, uh, and uh, there were instances, I believe, back in 2019, um, I'm not exactly sure whether anything was was uh, really uh, critical last year, but but I just wanted to know your your thoughts on that, how you're working with these these boats that pop up as taxis and all of that, and how that how that kind of shapes up. Thank you, um, Councillor Rowland. First of all, thank you very much for the acknowledgement of the uh, you know, contribution to the festival. That's great. That's really, always a nice start. Um, and I'm really pleased you brought this up, actually, because um, there is, um, and as we're in a public arena, I won't name the individual, but a vigilant person living across the river from the festival um, uh, who we had contact with during last year's festival has highlighted several concerns about river safety. And, and, and for those who are less familiar with the festival, um, obviously, we have a bridge over the river, but we also use Thames River Crews extensively to transport people from uh, the uh, Maple Durham site down to the main site, uh, that's staff mainly, uh, and also from uh, the car park at um, down the river, um, I've got the name of it, it's gone out of my head, uh, Kings Meadow, sorry, um, back up to the site. Um, but there are less scrupulous individuals running boats um, who I think sometimes are more permanent members of the river community in Reading, um, doing less regulated uh, movements of boats, etc. Um, and we have uh, at the behest or, or if you like led by by somebody who is you know watching what's going on and living on the river um, set up a working group to look at river safety um, that's ongoing I can't tell you exactly what's you know what the outcome is because we haven't reached an outcome yet but there are um, yeah there's a group which involves the environment agency uh, Thames Valley Police Reading Borough Council um, uh, Thames River Crews and ourselves looking at how we can mitigate the risks from the well the, the risks of, of accidents in the river but particularly those who may be which may be created by the individuals that we don't necessarily want near our festival goers i think we, we have a good idea who that is <laughs> um thank you councillor williams Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for coming in. I'd like to ask a little bit more about um, Adele, uh, Councillor Barnett Ward's uh, excellent question from the beginning. Um, you, you've been, uh, your presentation said you ran a successful festival and you've been working since 2007 on sustainability and your aim is to have a minimal uh, impact. So a two part question. The first is, was the festival a success from a sustainability point of view? And bearing in mind the, the pictures that we were all seeing from the member of the public who, who questioned at the beginning. And the second thing is, do you plan to do anything differently this coming year with regards to tents, sleeping bags, litter, rubbish? Or are you going to do the same as you did, uh, only with slightly more emphasis? Because I haven't heard, I don't think in your presentation or your answer to uh, Councillor Barrow, that you'll be doing anything differently. And if you don't do anything differently, won't we just see all these pictures again next year. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'll start um, kind of with the last bit of the question and then go on to the first bit, if that's OK. So if we're doing anything differently, so we are definitely going to be working more with the uh, uh, campaigning organisations that we know kind of have an impact. So the music declares emergency and that's something that uh, resonates with the audience quicker through the artists. So really seeing if we can push that get artists on board to really help amplify those messages. Um, we're building on, it, it's it's learning from what we've done and constantly building on it. And that's what we've, as I hope, kind of came out in the presentation as well. It's the, the Zero Waste Festival Goer campaign was the last two years, and that's that kind of peer-to-peer -peer influence as well. So it's learning on what works and seeing how we can enhance that. Um, and was the festival a success from a sustainability point of view? I think that that is a, a really good question and um, we're look, looking at the kind of overall carbon emissions is, is a kind of benchmark that we can use for that. Um, when we look at the Julie's Bicycle uh, data compared to our baseline year, which is in 2009, um, emissions have uh, leveled out rather than kind of the, the show has got bigger and bigger and bigger, but we've been able to keep those carbon emissions at a, a kind of a steady rate. Um, but the changes that we're doing for 2022, especially around biofuels, batteries, the technology, because carbon is 
the biggest impact of our on on site emissions. So that's what kind of our overall benchmark can be. Um, this year, I think we're going to see a considerable reduction in those carbon emissions and really trying to uh, meet the Reading Borough Council's net zero target by 2030 as well. Um, so yes, we are aware of the impacts and that they are, um, we're trying to kind of mitigate them as much as we can, but it's, it's having that visibility and also the transparency that we are open and that we are talking about this as well and really trying to um, show you what we're doing, how we're improving, and then I can send you more information in terms of the, the, the detail of those kind of carbon calculations, if that's, if you would like that. Can, can I just, uh, just <laughs> add just um, to the numbers? Um, I think in 2009, which was our base year, and this, I need to fact check this, um, James may remember, but I think we were licensed at about 75,000 in, in 2009, and we're now at 105. So mm -hmm. There is, whilst the, the, we may be we flatlined on, on, on the uh, carbon footprint, um, actually we've got 50% more people. Now, that, I know that's not necessarily a satisfactory answer, but but the we've, we've added possibly 35 to 40,000 people to the daily audience in that period. Thank you. Um, Councillor Singh. OK, thank you. Uh, in line with the councillor Josh Williams on sustainability, uh, thank you for confirming that you will be doing something uh, with the volunteers and announcing it through the artist on the main stage. But uh, like uh, Miss Leach, uh, there's hundreds of residents who are disappointed uh, with this. But at the same time, Reading Festival is a massive boost for our local economy and businesses. So. Um, a couple of things I had, uh, what more can be done, like a tent cost around 80 pounds shared by four people. So it doesn't make economical sense for the users to take it back. You know, it's 20 quid, they'll leave it behind. Is there any way to think a bit out of the box? Is that something you can provide on site, a reusable tent, which they can, you know, uh, cost them cheaper. So that way you, you, you have more kind of a control over the situation. So that could be one way to look at it and having your volunteers, which, you know, continuously pushing that message, a positive peer to peer message, which is going out uh, at the same time. Uh, I do believe high handedness may not work, right? People are there to enjoy and have fun. So, so yeah, and uh, information on your ticket, uh, something uh, probably on last day, you end up playing some message related to environment through through the artist. So clearly, if you can look from the economic perspective as well, where it is uh, much cheaper for, for the festival goers to come on site, use the tents which is available, which you can reuse, you know, uh, over the time. I'm sure they'll, I've seen some reusable tents and uh, that it can be done, but uh, definitely uh, there's a scope to pay more focus in this area and come up with a solution. I'm sure there's a solution, but it does demand more time and effort from your side. Yeah, definitely. And we have um, been working with innovations and ideas along that line around tents. So we do have tents that can be rented at, at the festivals as well, but it's having that price point comparison between, yeah, a £10 tent that you can buy in Tesco's compared to uh, £100 to, to rent a tent. But we do want to try and bring that price down and make that as a, a viable option for people. Um, a couple of years ago, we also tried a, a post it home mechanism as well, that you could put, collect your tent on site and then um, you, all you had to do was pack it up in like quite a big kind of IKEA bag, take it back to a drop off point and then they posted it home for you. So that was an initiative like yeah, a, a local business who wanted to try that and we gave them the, the space and time to do that. Um, and we also working with the volunteers on the ground on the Monday morning and um, having Extinction Rebellion really did help just offering to help pack people's tents up, you know, and just having that perceived surveillance of someone looking someone kind of watching you like we do find that that helps like having the message on kind of security guards making sure that they're almost then they're, they're not kind of there to um they couldn't physically help pack them up but it's just having that presence on the monday morning when everyone is leaving and sending that message so we worked um on another festival with a group who they did um the pop-up tent 
pack down trials. So we were just making a game out of it. And that's that was quite fun. So we had people trying to pack down a pop up tent within a record amount of time. And we found people wanted to come and get involved in the competition because they could win prizes. But we just did find people who were genuinely wanting to educate themselves on it. You know, it's it's easy to pop it up, but to actually pack it down and having more education things like that on the big screens, like how do you pack down a tent and really using our social media and our apps to to make it fun and it almost kind of gets some influencers involved as well who can be packing down their pop-up tents and it's educational. So it's, it's trying to look through what all the barriers are for people leaving their tents behind, that they've got to pack it up, they've got to carry it far away to the camps, to the car parks and um, seeing where we can actually try and re remove or reduce some of those barriers. All right, thank you. So I have got Councillor Leng, Councillor Hacker and Councillor McGonagall. We're now going to be getting towards an hour and 20 minutes or something. It's kind of no more questions, I'm afraid, but uh, just these people who've already indicated. So Councillor Leng. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. It was just to go back to everybody talking about sustainability. I'm going to go back to your Brexit point about when you said about um, you couldn't get all the cleaners because of Brexit. I was interested because all major sites during COVID times recognised cleaners as, as being an essential part of the team. They improved paying conditions, no shortage of cleaners. So maybe it's more to do with your bidding process for your contractors. They need to improve conditions and pay and maybe you won't struggle to get cleaners. Thank you. No, it's, it's a fair question as well. Um, we, we've used the same company. We've used the same company at many events, um, and we were let down. Is the short answer? We were let down really badly because they didn't tell us they couldn't get people until we got there, and then uh, suddenly we had a lack of. Um, and we're now looking. We're reviewing the. Com I'm not saying we don't use the same company, but you know they they badly let us down. And we're reviewing who we use for this coming year as well. I'm just saying from from a point of view that um, if you're running an, an organisation like yours and, um, you know, sites recognise if canteens aren't clean, toilets aren't clean, people can't work, sites won't open. It's as simple as that. It's an essential thing that has to be sorted out. That's not a question. So. No, no, no. And then it's a fair, it's a fair, it is a fair point. Um, we, we, we only realised we hadn't got the staff when the campsite opened um, and we, we've we used the same company for um, you know for several years we've used them on many shows in the UK and Ireland um, and they let us down um, that's the only thing I would say. Thank you I think I think that's been dealt with vice abusing the vice chair's privileges I'm afraid no no, no we can't ask anymore um, <laughs> and if you haven't already indicated that I've said that you're not getting a question uh, Councillor Hacker. Thank you chair um, I am a councillor, one of the three councillors that covers a lot of the festival sites of a battle ward uh, with the boundary changes if I'm re-elected in May. We have even more of it, which is a great thing. Um, however, as, as Jennifer said and others have said, there is a huge problem with the amount of waste left behind. We had some really interesting um, statistics around reducing and recycling, but obviously recycling has its own energy costs. Um, I am a camper, I have a ridiculously large tent and I know how hard it is to put them away. It requires an awful lot of effort. Smaller tents, less effort, but still it's not as easy as as, pick it, as putting one up. So tents has been dealt with. My question is, what can we do to see more reuse on site? So I've, I've probably brought this out a billion times before. Bunk fest down the road, Wallingford Free Festival, you have to reuse the cups. You have no choice. You buy a lovely plastic cup, you have to use that cup. Um, I think it's a wonderful initiative. Um, I sadly believe that over the last couple of years we've got a little bit more used to single use once again. I think we were making good progress, but the pandemic has made us realise that it's OK to throw things away, lateral flow tests, single use masks and all this. And that's going to be a tough thing to get used to to reusing and not being so frightened of of reusing items. But I think more can be done for reuse, whether it's with um, cups, whether, you know, I saw water bottles, whether it's with plates, knives and forks, washing up facilities for people to wash their cups and plates and things if they want to reuse them. I'd like to, to see more of that and I'd like you to tell me if you're going to plan to see more reuse, which drastically reduces the amount of energy used compared to recycling going forward. 
Yeah, thank you. I can I can talk about that, and I and I do share the frustrations that we seem to have been slipped back almost into a single use culture because of COVID. So I want to try and actually move away from that because I think in 2019 we did get into a, a really good place where people were bringing their reusable cup, they their, their coffee cups. People did have their reusable bottles. So yeah, you pointed pointed out that we do have the reusable bottle scheme. Um, cups. We do use reusable cups at other festivals and we need to just be really careful that looking at the whole carbon life cycle of those cups. So um, they have to be transported from the kind of where they're being produced to the festival site and then they are actually kind of washed off site as well. So we need to factor in the, the carbon emissions of, of the cups. So um, that's something that we look at from a show by show basis. Just, just to clarify, at Bunkfest, you take it home. It's not reusable between the sites. You buy it, it's yours. Mm -hmm. I've still got them about four or five years later. That's what I mean by yeah. reusable, so people can take the product mm -hmm. home and bring it back the following year, just to clarify. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we, we do do that at, at other events, so, but they can only be used once on site because you can't refill a re reusable cup from draft um, or the automatic pourer units that we use. So it's just, it's thinking through the logistics. I'm not saying kind of it's impossible, um, but for the Reading and Leeds, audience the price of a, a drink is already quite expensive um, so to add another cost on top of that but the where um, the kind of festival or sustainability festival world is going when it comes to reusables is to use unbranded cups so they can um, go to different festivals and get the reuse so to outweigh the environmental impacts of a, a single use cup versus a reusable cup they have to be used 14 times and there's a few different papers out there that between 10 and 14 times it varies depending on the life cycle assessment that you see so that's why we want to make sure that unbranded festival cups are used so we're looking in to see whether that could be something we could look at across a number of festivals to, so people don't take it home and it gets that 14 uses at other events as well. So that's something that's happening across Europe as well with Live Nation. So we're very close to kind of watching what that's what's going on there and seeing if we can implement similar things here. So it's definitely something that we're we're looking at. So thank you. Thank you. So last question, Councillor McGonagall, you still got it? Thank you, Chair. Let's hope it's a good one. Uh, I was just going to ask about the rent a tent scheme, uh, but you've already mentioned that. But aside from actual glamping, and I don't know if uh, Reading Festival has any glamping, I've not been, but I've been to WOMAD and they've had just very basic tents that you can rent in advance and uh, it does cost more, but it's a little, I mean, it's probably not much more than buying a disposable tent and leaving it behind. Um, but, and it's probably a, a lot more work for a build, but that employs people. Um, so it's, it's great to be able to just rock up with your bedding and your extra clothes and then just leave it all behind because you've uh, that's the system so uh, I, would there be more of that in the future do you think I mean do you have that at the moment and you know will, could that just increase rapidly mm -hmm. um, over the years also another quick question uh, if you've been dancing drinking for you know, and whatever for the last four days you must be exhausted on Monday morning. How how fixed is the time for leaving? Is it midday? Do you have to be off site by midday or is that fairly flexible? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the tent rental options, um, we, you, there, we did have uh, two different packages, so there is a cheaper package as well. It's just trying to get that price point right, but it's definitely something that I want to increase. Um, to give people more options and to have that comparison between a, a cheap tent that you can buy. Um, and it's just a very basic setup. So that is something that is available. And we have um, looked into also potentially like eco campsites as well. That's been quite successful at Download Festival. So it's giving the people the opportunity who do want to take their tents home and do want to leave a clean, uh, tidy site behind and that they can have somewhere to camp and and encourage and see that positive behavior and encourage that positive behavior as well so it's almost not kind of tarnish everyone with the same brush it's actually uh, rewarding or kind of recognizing those people that do that do take their tents home um the time frame for leaving i don't know if you want to come in on that yeah the time frame for leaving um i think if we didn't put a time people would still be there on the wednesday um 
we're fortunate in Reading in that we've got excellent links to public transport. So some of the issues, and I'm not saying nobody drives tired from Reading Festival, but we're really well served by the coaches and by Reading train station. Um, but yeah, the, the, the time is that, well, A, it's in the license. Um, so we are bound by the license, but we, you know, it, I think it's also about welfare. Having people leaving sight means those people that maybe are struggling and need some attention, we know who they are because they're sort of the ones that are left. But if we extended it beyond 12 o'clock, I think people would be there till five o'clock. And if we extended it till the Tuesday, they'd still be there on the Tuesday. People are already there in some cases for five nights because they've arrived on the Wednesday. Um, so having the limit, I mean, I'm happy to discuss further whether or not 12 o'clock is the right time, but I think people would, yeah, they'll, they'll only leave when we require them to leave. Excellent, thank you. Um, I, like the, uh, I note the question was drinking, dancing or whatever. Uh, was a, draw a veil over the whatever. Yeah? Um, so uh, thanks for, for, for answering all those questions. I mean, I just want to say that we're all supporters of Reading Festival and we're all glad that Reading Festival is in our town. And we acknowledge that it's a it's a it's a boon to the town. And you've talked about the benefits it brings and the financial benefits, et cetera, and, and the reputational benefits. Uh, do you disagree with me? Um, and but on the other hand, I would also hope that people of whom we represent are happy that we are scrutinizing you in the way that they would want and asking the questions that they would put if they were able to be here. And you know, thank you, Ms. Leach came along as well to ask on the same sort of broad broad topic. Um, so 